Good morning. It's nice to see you here. And um, today we're talking about, uh, well, the title is It's All About Feel. And what I'm going to do for some of these coming up webinars is just to debunk some of the training myths. And I wanted to start with this one in particular because I think it's, it's quite broad and it's something I hear a lot. What people tell me is I can't learn from a video. Like I can't, there's no point in my getting online training because I can't learn from a video because it's all about feel. Um, and, and my answer to that is, well, I'm, I'm not sure that you're right. I, don't, I think it is all about feel. It's all about how, what you feel when you um, are training your horse or riding your horse. But I don't think that's a reason not to learn from a video or not to learn from an online course. I think actually it's just the opposite. And today I want to explain why I think that. And I think the first thing we need to do is define what feel is because it's a, it's a big catch all, isn't it? And, and it works actually as a great excuse. You know, I can't learn from an online course um, because it's all about feel and you, there's no feel on an online course and I can't afford an instructor. Therefore I can't do anything with my horse. I can't improve my horse's training. You know, I can't do anything positive in that way with my horse because all doors are closed to me. And, you know, of course, exactly the opposite is true and feel what, I feel is going to be different from what you feel, which is the major reason that having somebody standing there in three dimensions as opposed to two dimensions is um, is actually in, a, in many ways worse. And um, so first of all, I want to just talk about what feel means. And I think that it's, it's rather misunderstood because what feel is to me might be very different to what it is to you. And we talk about feel quite a lot in horse training and yet we don't define it and I think that's a mistake so let's think about something like a good contact now you're quite often told especially in dressage circles to have a good contact and yet nobody ever tells you what that is so for me the feel of a good contact might be two newtons of pressure on the horse and yet I know that there's a lot of dressage riders riding around with a good contact that's 45 newtons of pressure on the horse. So it's a very different thing. Um, you know, to me, for me to ask the horse to move forward using the leg, apply the leg, that's a feel. For me, it's the lightest of touches. For somebody else, it might be a big fat kick. So again, you know, it's completely different and it's something actually, that only you and your horse can work out. So it's no good me telling you, even if I'm standing in the middle of the arena, to apply four newtons of pressure to the left rein. Because, well, A, that probably won't mean anything to you at all. Um, and really, you want to apply as much pressure as it takes to get a response, and then you want to release all of that pressure. And that's something you could do without me standing there telling you how to do that. So there are, there are other sorts of things that are involved with feel, of course. So there's our seat, where our seat is on the horse, how the horse feels underneath us, that's a feel thing. And um, of course our balance as well, that's a feel thing, how we're balanced on the horse. But a lot of what we probably think of broadly as feel is actually more associated with sight and what we're seeing. So a lot of what people are thinking about that they need an expert for are actually things that they can observe. So for example, if the horse is stressed or frustrated, um, that's something you can see. So we were talking yesterday about horses in the round pen that feel chased and the difference between a horse that feels chased and a horse that's fed up with being chased. So they're two different things, aren't they? Because you might feel sometimes that you're chasing your horse. If you've got a horse that perhaps is being really lazy in the round pen, or if you've got a horse that has been chased in the round pen before, then that horse is going to exhibit different behaviors from the horse that is feeling chased. So it, the important thing is not being able to feel something, it's being able to see it. It's being able to recognize the behaviors that are indicating what is going on in the horse's head. 
And we'll find this all the time when we're riding. So if you're riding along, you ask your horse for a canter transition, you put your leg on and you squeeze and you do all the things that you usually do. The horse pins its ears and pig roots. That's a feel thing, yes. It's also a see thing. You could see that before the horse actually pig rooted. You could see the response that the horse was going to make. So it, it doesn't matter whether you have someone in the middle of the arena telling you that or whether you actually learn to observe that yourself. And the advantage, of course, of learning to observe it yourself is that you're actually engaging your own brain as well. So there's a big difference, isn't there, being shown how to do something. It's like, imagine you're in a car where, and you're you're trying to find your way to a new place. You're going to a friend's house. You've got somebody in the passenger seat. They've got Google Maps up. They're saying, turn left, turn right, go here, go there. That's a really different deal to next time you do it and you haven't got Google Maps and you haven't got your friend, do you remember? No, you don't because you have been told exactly what to do. You didn't make any mistakes. You didn't go down a wrong turning. You didn't have to think, you know, what came after William Street? Do I turn left or right on, you know, Mayfair Road? You didn't have to think of any of these things. You just, you did exactly what you were told. You didn't engage your brain. So when you come to do it a second time, you don't have any of that experience there. The same thing happens when you're always only training your horse or only really properly engaging with your horse when you have an instructor standing in the middle of the arena who's telling you what to do. And, you know, we've all, we've all been there. You, know, you, you, can have, you can have lessons with the best person in the world. You can have the most expensive lessons. And I always love it when people say to me, oh, I have lessons with so-and-so, you know, ex-Olympic rider. And I'm like, well, that's great. Um, but, you know, most of those people will give anybody lessons. It's not really saying anything about you. It's saying a lot about them. But what are they telling you? What are you actually taking away from that lesson? And each time you have a lesson, and how are you using that information to improve your horse's life or your horse's performance or your horse's training? And I think that's really important. So what happens when you actually sit at home and you watch the online videos, for example, you have to think about that. You sit in your sitting room and you digest that and you think, oh, okay, I wonder how this is going to apply to my horse. My horse is a bit different from the horse I see on the video. I wonder how my horse will respond to that. That engages your brain. You then have to remember all that information. You take that out to your horse and you have a go. You know? And that's the big thing, I think, is having a go. Because I look at people that come into the can-do training and the ones that attend the meetings, the ones that go out and have a go, are streets ahead of the ones that don't. I mean, streets ahead. And it, it's really interesting to see because a lot of them start as the much less experienced people, but they go out and have a go. And I think this comes back to a lot of things in life. You know, we have this big fear of failure. Oh, what if I don't get it right? And with horse riding, it can be particularly difficult because if we don't get it right, we could get injured. And, and I think that is sort of at the back of a lot of people's mind. I don't want to try because, you know, if I get on the horse, it's not right, I could fall off. <laughs> yes, love that. Um, sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, I could fall off if I don't get it right. So we don't, we don't actually try. We don't do anything. Another thing that stops us from doing anything is not knowing. Oh, I didn't know how to do it, so I didn't do anything. Um, you know, I wanted, really wanted to train the horse to, you know, be more responsive or be lighter in the bridle or, or something, but I didn't know how to do it. So I just kept doing what I was always doing. So not having a go is that it comes back to that fear of failure. And what I do believe is, yes, it is all about feel, but it's all about your feel. And you're not going to learn anything unless you actually go out and give it a try. And I think that's another reason. And it's why the can-do training always starts on the ground. We start everything on the ground because you're much safer on the ground. Therefore, the horse is much safer as well. And anything that the horse can do on the ground, you can then take to the saddle. So it's very important that we get these things when we're safely on the ground and we 
allow the horse to digest that information and build on that strong foundation. So it's all about feel and it's all about your feel. What you're doing when you train the horse is you're building a bubble of communication. So think of the rein or the lead rope, if you've just got that horse in a head collar, perhaps, or the rein, if you're teaching give to the bit. The rein is like a telephone. You pick up pressure and the horse then picks up the other end or you, you know, imagine telephone ring, you pick it up, you go, hello, hello, hello. Um, if there's nobody there, you put it down eventually. You pick it up again, it rings again, you pick it up again, hello, 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 there's nobody there, you put it down. This, you might, you know, if you're a really patient person, you might pick it up three or four times. But on the fifth time, you're just going to ignore it. You're not going to pick it up anymore. And that's what the horse does with rain pressure. Exactly the same thing. You know, the, you pick up pressure, the horse will try responding, the horse will go hello, 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 in movement, the horse will move in different directions. If you don't let it go, eventually the horse is just going to ignore it. So the horse will let you pick up pressure, but it won't try and respond. It won't look for an answer. It won't say hello. And that is what's happening when horses desensitize to cues. The reason that's happening is because the handler and the person doing the exercise, picking up that pressure, didn't have an end goal. They didn't have in their mind what it was that they really wanted the horse to do and that's what feel is that's what we need to find and for each horse the feel is going to be slightly different so if you're standing next to the horse and you pick up pressure on one rein you have to know the response that you want the horse to make so that you can release all that pressure as soon as the horse makes that response that's feel that's what we need to find. And that's what only you can find. So you, you're at home, you watch the video, you see the horses responding, you understand that, you understand what the pressure is, that you apply as much pressure as needed to get that response, and then you release it and you know when to release it. The other thing you know is that each time you apply pressure, you should have to apply less pressure so you know we're teaching patterns of behavior for the horse so the horse if you reach your hand up to grab that rein to apply the pressure the horse has one two three cues so if you do this really carefully what you'll find is when you go to reach your hand up the horse gives to the bit the horse learns the pattern really fast that is what feel is about. So I can take your horse as your instructor and I can warm the horse up. And I used to love doing this, you know, <laughs> lessons, giving people lessons. Oh, I'll ride your horse for the first 10 minutes. That'll be fun. And, um, and then when you get on, the horse is actually still in my bubble. So still communicating with me and still being soft in the bridle because I've been doing pressure release with the horse and the horse has really got that. And the horse is relaxed and the rider gets on and that lasts for a little while it depends on the rider but you know that will that bubble will stay there for a little while but pretty soon it'll burst because the rider will do something different the rider is not me you know it is not my horse it is not my bubble i have the bubble when i'm on the horse on the ground or under saddle but it's your bubble it's your feel that's what we need to be building not mine. It doesn't matter what I can get the horse to do. I might be able to get the horse to do flying changes. I might be able to get the horse to do all sorts of wonderful things. But that's my bubble. That's me communicating with the horse. That's me getting the horse into the engagement zone, not you. And that's what we need to do. We need to get you creating your own bubble with that horse. We need to get you and the horse communicating via this pressure release and teaching these sorts of really consistent patterns, knowing when to release, knowing with each individual horse and each individual lesson, how much pressure you're going to need to get the response so that you can release, so that you don't desensitize the horse to pressure. We need you to understand how much to increase the horse's emotional level 
to get the horse to engage with learning. And these are all things that are, they are absolutely all about feel, but they're all about your feel, no, not anybody else's. You know your horses better than anybody else. And it's really important that you understand how each of them perceive feel. Because these horses behind me, they'll all be slightly different. They'll all have slightly different histories as well. So I might pick up pressure on one of these horses and I might only need two newtons of pressure to get the horse to respond, to give to the bit, for example. And on the next one, I might need four newtons. And on the next one, I might just need to go close and the horse will respond. So they're all going to be different. So I think, you know, talking about feel as some, something that is the same for everybody and the same uh, for every horse is really unrealistic. What we're really talking about is bubble building. What we're really talking about is communicating with that horse. And what we're really aiming for is to use less and less pressure, which is the feel, but the pressure is our motivator to respond. So we don't want to keep increasing that. We want to decrease that all the time. We want to make the horse more sensitive and more in the bubble, more in the engagement zone, more engaged with us so that we don't need so much pressure to teach the horse to respond, to get the same response with less pressure is what self-carriage is all about. And that is really where we're going. So that's it for me for today. If you're on live, hang around because I'm going to turn off the recording and do some Q&A and I will see you next week. Bye.